everyone, and welcome to Gerard the Dinosaur, the podcast where we take a look at people behind the scenes in the entertainment industry. Today, I have with me my good friend Claudia Kubaric, who is a violin player here at the School of Music at the University of Illinois. We met each other our sophomore year at school, and she is going to tell us a little more about herself. Thanks for having me, John. Oh, yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah, let's get started. So tell us a little more about what you do in the school about violin performance. Well, I think the major kind of says it all, violin performance. So, um, of course, I take the core music classes everyone needs to know about, you know, music theory, music history, all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. But then the rest of the time is spent playing in different settings, whether that be in a practice room alone to... In, increase your own abilities or in chamber music to um, to kind of learn how to create music with others and a lot of time spent is spent one-on-one -on -one with professors which is a really big plus of the major and it's it's kind of funny because after a performance it's like weird after a casual performance it's weird if people just applaud and say good job because in this major you're so used to playing for people and then they're, they just like rip your playing apart so that you like learn how to play better so we spend a lot of time in like studio classes and um, where we play for other violinists. So it's a lot of it's a lot of time holding the violin in your hand on any given day. That's for sure. No, that makes sense because the other day you performed in class and I was like, oh my gosh, Claudia, that was the best thing I've ever heard. But you said that there was someone else like giving you tips and stuff on how oh, you could yes, be yeah. doing it better. Oh, and... Of course, um, you know, gearing up for like recitals and stuff. Like it's awesome to get performances in, but I still go to my violin friends like. So like, what did you, what did you think? Like, what could I, what could I work on next? So it's kind of like a never ending feedback loop. But, um, no, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty great. Uh, sorry, I'm really thirsty. I and this that you water, can edit. and this water, oh, I'm not editing this out. I am really thirsty and oh, this wow. water okay. is giving me life. I, yeah, I see that. This episode is sponsored by water. Make sure you drink water. <laughs> hey. Eight glasses a day, guys. Um, okay, so so tell me, how did you get into it? How did you get into like being liking? Well, I mean, obviously everyone likes music, or mostly everyone likes music. But how did you get into like wanting to play music, the violin, stuff like that? Tell me your tell me your story. Tell me That's your story. really funny because the first time the concept of a violin was like in my life was in kindergarten. We we went to like uh, music class and. We all got like a coloring sheet of a different instrument or something. And my friend Tiffany got a violin and she was like, I want to learn how to play the violin when I'm older. And I, I, I kid you not. I remember my first thought being like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> like, I was just like, you know what I mean? Like, even as a kindergartner, I was kind of like, why would you want to learn the violin? And then fast forward two years. I'm not sure what it was. I don't know if it was Hannah Montana or like all the guitars I've seen on TV, but I wanted to play guitar. But like the cool electric guitar, obviously, but my mom was like, okay, if you want to play guitar, you have to do classical guitar, you know, learn the instrument. So I did that for about two years. And but in those two years, I was exposed to my friends playing violin. They played like the Canon by Papa Bell. I like heard Vivaldi's Spring and I was like, oh my God, that's such a cool piece. Dun, 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 da, 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 da. Yeah, it was, I was just like, wow, magnificent, beautiful. Um, and then, I don't know, I kind of got into, like, the literature written for violin. Like, I like, I just like the classical music written. I like Vivaldi. I would watch, like, Julia Fisher on YouTube. And, I don't know, just one day I was like, oh, mom, like, I, I want to play violin. Can I, can I do this thing? And then, since the first lesson, I kind of liked figuring out the instrument. Like, guitar lost its charm completely. Like, by the end of those two, three years, my mom would, like, remind me to practice and all that stuff but violin was kind of like nah I wanted to you know so I didn't know at the time I would end up majoring in violin but um yeah from the start it was kind of the music I really liked the music and I, I wanted the ability to play it one day and it's kind of cool that I stuck with it long enough to finally be playing all that stuff I was listening to in fourth grade well that's neat that that's like um that was like me growing up with my instruments I had a really short attention span with instruments um when I grew up, I really wanted to play the, while I was growing up, I really wanted to play the, uh, the piano. And 
I started out, like, you know, like practicing the piano every day, blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, no, this is boring. And so then I got into the saxophone and I was like, I'll play the saxophone. Yeah, I like the saxophone. And I practiced the saxophone every day and I was like, no, this is boring. And so then in high school, I was like, I'll play the oboe. And I practiced the oboe every day, even in high school. And now I'm here in college where I have no time and no will to live. <laughs> um, that second one was a joke, everyone. No, John. John's doing great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's great to hear. And it's great to hear that you ended up on the violin because you really are very good at it. Thank you. Um, no, it's just funny. One day I just remembered kindergarten, literally just thinking, like, why would you want to do that? And my mom asked, like, when I wanted to play guitar, are you sure you don't want to do violin or piano? I was like, nah, nah, man. So here we are. You know, life takes turns. If you could go back, would there any be any other, like, tertiary instruments that you'd be like, dang, those look pretty cool. I'd like to try those out. If I, I know that if I didn't play violin, I'd pro- probably play oboe. <laughs> I, I, I mean it. I love oboe. And I also, I also sometimes, I regret not being a woodwind because, I don't know, woodwind players are kind of the best people in a way. <sighs> Thank you. Stop that. Oh they're my gosh. they're just you know they're all you know very eccentric individual people and you know I feel like I'd love to be part of that community but I'll stick to to violin <laughs> maybe in my next strings. life or something. This is this is um, no I'm gonna come back to this later but I have a like a very um, more like just a question about the violin instrument in general but remind me remind me to ask you maybe after like the. Okay, I'll try to remember. Um, okay, so speaking, so we picked your instrument. You like the violin. When did you know that, like, music performance was your thing? Like, you wanted to be the major. That was what you wanted to do with the rest of your life. Okay, so um, even though I really intensely liked playing violin from the start, so I started when I was um, nine, like, two, three months away from my 10th birthday, so almost 10 which is kind of late for, like, violin performance standards, but... So, I just kind of practiced because I liked it. I liked learning about it. I liked, you know, trying to get good as quick as I could at the instrument. But, um, I don't know. I just remember my mom, like, mentioning it to me that it's very hard to make it as a musician. It's kind of hard to make money. It's, you know, you have to be one of the best to, to make it. So I never really thought about music that way. I just, I kind of like threw it in the back of my head. Um, and then she passed away when I was like 10 or 11. And then I kept playing. Um, well, actually I was 11. I don't know why I said 10 or 11, but, um, and I kept playing and I, so I didn't have any parental pressure to do, you know, go into violin or not. But I remember just like, watching a symphony orchestra and it was like one of my first times hearing an orchestra and I just loved the sound and I realized like oh my god these are like uh, like adults like 50 year old people like creating music and they know how to do this at such a high level that paired with a friend telling me that she wanted to like go into violin and end up recording movie soundtracks and playing an orchestra and all that stuff she ended up actually she just did her PhD in like psychology so that didn't happen (laughs) But that conversation made me realize, like, oh, man, like, you can, people do this for a living. Like, people, this, this is a job. Like, you, you can do this. It, it's like, it wasn't a concept to me. I love that. And then when I realized, like, oh, man, like, I, I could do that. Like, that's a, that's a, that's a career path. People do this for a living, um, or try to. And I guess that kind of started my ideas and I played around with it in middle school. I still wasn't sure. I had some, one foot in possibly medicine and stuff, but, uh, you know, as, as a kid, you don't really know what you're going to be. But in high school, I remember just realizing, okay, I want to do violent performance. I want a shot at doing this for a living. And after, like, my first year of high school, I kind of gave up all my sports and everything I did extra. Because I realized I needed to sit down and focus on violin to play a game of catch-up and, you know, get my skill level as high as, high as I could before college. Mm-hmm if I were to have a shot at this, because mm-hmm. it's not one of those things that you do on the side and you make it. Yeah. But it's kind of funny how I didn't realize that people can do it for a living. Mm-hmm. So once I realized that, I was like, hmm, that actually sounds good. <laughs> and like, I know you told me for the first, um, like one, one and a half years of college that you were in the computer science department for a hot minute. 
would you say that part of that was still like a little bit of doubt that you weren't sure 100% completely if it was viable? So that that transition happened my senior year of high school, just all the after the three years of, you know, hard work and kind of being self-defeating in a way, just kind of, it's good to push yourself and, you know, try to do your best, but it, it became a cycle of like, I don't know, complete stress. Um, and even though I got into some universities for violin performance, there are, there were two I sent a pre-screening to, which is you send a video ahead of time and then mm-hmm. they ask you to audition. And I was not asked to audition at those two schools. Oh. And that was like kind of the first time I experienced rejection, if that made sense. Cause yeah. you know, everything went swimmingly through high school. I always made the grades and everything. So that was really tough and. It kind of, it kind of made me question my path. And I, I kind of, it, it's kind of like I needed a mental escape from violin and the pressures I put on myself. So in a way, I, you know, I was really into web design, front end development at the time. So I was thinking maybe I'll minor in computer science. And then that just became a major in computer science. And that pro, that summer I did like the program with Google and I like sat down and I was like, okay, this is going to be my life now. And I, transferred to U of I and for one semester I was I was started working on getting into the computer science department here but I took le- violin lessons with a doctorate student here and I would play like the day before at two in the morning because I mean I was just doing CS stuff all day it's rough here <laughs> it's yeah this is yeah these these kids work for their CS degrees that's all I'll say and I I just realized I can't um I can't not play violin. I I can't. Like, even now, if I ever have doubts and I think about other things I could possibly do, it's just like, oh, I can't I can't pursue that path because, you know, it won't give me the time I need to become really proficient at this instrument. So I kind of it was a really good step away to refine why I was doing it in the first place. And it wasn't to beat myself up over my playing. It was just like. Life is the hours that go by and what you spend doing them. It's not like weekends. A lot of people live life like life is weekends and the vacations. But I think life is every day you wake up. And it's like, I want to spend most of those hours creating music. Good for you. So and I feel like I'll be richer in that sense. You know, maybe I, I mean, who knows? But, you know, a lot of my accounting friends or uh, CS friends or whatever will probably be a lot better off. But I feel like, you know, I can't. I can't give up hours of my life for money in a way. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It was it was really refreshing to take calc for one semester and find my way back to music. So no, literally, it's <laughs> the same way. That's the the same path I took. CS to music and signing the form and hitting the send button on the email was like literally a heavy weight being lifted off my shoulders. Yeah, I just I remember it was kind of it was kind of an impulse decision because I got in as performance here and I, I actually decided to come and be a general student in hopes of transferring to CS. And one day I just walked into music admissions like can I can you please let me back into the school of music? And you know, they they did cuz you know, they talked to the violin professors. I had already auditioned and been accepted and They had room to take me in, so it worked out great. But I remember that morning, I had no idea that later that day I would, like, make that move that would change my trajectory yet yet again. So it's, you never never know. But I'm thankful because I probably wouldn't have been at the school if I didn't choose CS first. Mm -hmm. So the detour led me to the correct place. That's great. That's great. So speaking of... um, I don't know how to make a segue from that. I'm still I'm still recovering. That was really inspirational. Was it really? Yeah. I, I don't know. I just kind of realized. I mean, you, <laughs> you, who you are as a person is kind of based on what you spend hours doing, you know? Yeah. It just shapes who you are and choose it wisely, guys. I mean, especially those of you that are still deciding what paths you want to take, whether you're 40 or ending high school. Really consider what 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 do you want your life being? What what do you want to put your hours into? Gosh, I really like that. Ugh. Ugh, I wish I was just a listener right now so I could hit the pause button and reflect. Um, if you're the listener, hit the pause button right now and reflect and reflect. <laughs> um, okay, so 
Let's move away from that now that I'm assuming they've hit the pause button and reflect. Let's talk about pieces. Let's talk about the pieces that you've played. Is there one production that you've been in or one piece that you've played that you really liked, you really enjoyed, you were like, like the most? You were like, wow, that really challenged me or that really was the, the, uh, the, the peak of my skills so far. I've had awesome opportunities in college to play a lot of orchestra rap and we did some operas. But the the one thing that came in mind when you were asking that is last semester we did Britain's War Requiem. And that was, I actually saw Chicago Symphony perform that in high school and I wasn't, I wasn't sure what I was getting into. Like I, <laughs> I didn't know much about the piece. I didn't know much about the background. I, I, I wasn't at a place to appreciate it yet, but playing it, it's this huge piece, huge orchestra, all the choirs, you know, everyone playing it. And it was, it was like the first time that I kind of got emotional, even being in, in a production. Like you go to opera, people cry or something, you know, but you're, you're in the pit doing your work. This one, it felt kind of real. I was like immersed in the experience with the audience, especially because we had a lot of tacit, like I wasn't playing the whole time. And and then, you know, at the end, after this whole war requiem, the, you know, it's it's like a scene of like two soldiers kind of saying like, let their, like, you know, let us rest. And it's, it, I, don't, I don't know, it was just very um, kind of surreal to, to be in that space mm-hmm. at that time, so... Yeah, Britain's War Requiem. If you ever see a live performance at a symphony near you, like 10 out of 10, Go recommend. Check it out. Hashtag Claudia recommends. Yeah. Is there, I, I, don't, I don't dare ask this question, is there, okay. a, is there a piece you, you don't like? Is there a least favorite piece out there you've been like, oof? I mean, first thing that came to mind is like Canon and D. <laughs> Just because I've played it so many oh, times. Honey. Like, the only, so my brother loves that piece, so I guess the only times I'll play it now is from my brother or if I get paid for, at someone's wedding. But like, God forbid, no one's playing that at my wedding. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no. They're gonna be playing literally any other song but Canon and D as I watch it's, it's that. It's a masterwork. I mean, it's a full on canon. Like, we're, we're studying canons in Counterpoint and Fugue and we had to write one as an assignment. Like, I, you know, congrats for that guy for, you know, writing a perfect canon in three voices. <laughs> you know, you know, to the listeners, so all canon in D works is you, you have a melody, you know, that starts and, you know, you play through the whole thing and the next voice comes in later and the third one comes in later and they're playing the exact same piece of music. But the fact that they started at different times, it, and it just works so well. There's harmonic progressions. There's, you know, the interesting melody, melody and accompaniment, like any moment. So that's, it's, it's a miracle of music, but I've heard it way too many times. And also, for those that might be violinists listening, I'm upset that Prokofiev Violin Concerto 2 is programmed a lot more than Prokofiev Violin Concerto 1, but that's just my two cents. I don't understand what that means, but violinists out there, if you do, more power to Unpopular you. Unpopular opinion, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so it is at this point where we take all the, not theoretical, but personal questions, and we take them in a box, and we move them okay. to the side. You're going to ask something about the violin as an instrument, remember? Yeah, I, I asked oh, about, okay, this is the point where I ask cool. about the violin as an instrument now. But I'm going to ask that, I'm still going to ask that a little later down the line. First, um, right now we ask you about like the physical, in case people are instrument, in case people are instrument, in case people are <laughs> interested in, you know, playing the violin okay. or something like that. So let's start off with the easy stuff. Um, where did you get your first violin, or how do people in general get violin, or something like that? That's a good question. So um, I personally, when I started with my teachers, they owned a bunch of smaller sized violins that um, you know I just kind of rented, and then I ended up buying one. But because I started when I was 10, I went through like three instruments. I started on a half size, then three fourths, and then I got a full instrument. So... Um, I I guess if someone's starting from smaller instruments, they could rent it from like their local music shop or buy it and return it or I I don't I don't know. But for full size instruments, I think I got mine from Southwest Strings, which is like 
a shop in like uh, Texas or Arizona, just you know, far far away from here where it's warmer. And it was like a two hundred seventy five dollar violin. It was decent for what it was. Obviously, it wouldn't serve mm-hmm. me well now, but it, it did its job. So I w- I would just recommend looking at violin shops, not spending too much money, but don't spend fifty dollars on Amazon. <laughs> I I I've, I've never seen one of those instruments, but I can imagine it's it it's not very it's not very good. I don't wanna I don't wanna make you cringe, but how much does like a like a college level violin would you say count, uh, cost? Um. Based on like myself and my peers, I would say that uh, a lot of people walking into college have a violin between two and five thousand. Oh, and then they upgrade to a violin that's about ten thousand. There are people here. I'm not gonna name names that do have like s- not vi- not violinists necessarily. So it's different for cello and viola, but there are there are certain instruments that are definitely like sixteen to twenty thousand. Oh no, honey, no. It's, no. it's too much. And John, you don't you don't you don't you have to remember you buy them both separately. Stop that. The yeah. bow can't cost more than like ten dollars. Oh my the, yeah. Oh my try like two to five thousand or something. It's just the bow? I have a friend that has an eight thousand dollar bow, yeah. Why? What's special about the bow? Does it wash my dishes? No, it does not wash your dishes. <laughs> Actually, you can use dish soap to wash the hair if you really need to, but at that point, you can just change the hair. Um, I don't know. You'd be surprised. I I mean, I was very grateful that my, my teachers in high school kind of uh, let me have slash borrow. I, don't, I should really give it back, but I haven't seen them this year yet. <laughs> I had like a, a carbon fiber uh, Kodo bow that was like $800, which is a lot of money. But it's pretty low end for bows, and when I got a new instrument, it just did not sound good. It just, you know, there was like a a scratchy kind of sound. It was just, the fact that it's not a natural, uh, carbon fiber is very strong. It's not a natural, it doesn't have much give, not a natural material, I mean. So a wooden bow really makes a huge difference. Um, Probably because it's wood. Like, I'm not saying wood is like bendy, but like... Just has a more subtle give and it has a be- better balance. And bows are crafted by hand. It's an artwork making bows. So, I mean, with violins, you can find anything from like $50 to like you name the price. It, it exists probably. So, yeah. So, no, but all these people, we insure our stuff. It's just, you know, oh really God. expensive stuff. So, yeah, my oboe is kind of expensive it's well i shouldn't say kind of it is expensive it's two thousand dollars and it's used oh yeah um, woodwind instruments are very woodwind, expensive. especially oh but like oh my goodness six ten thousand dollars for a violin it's crazy um, yeah it's like you can buy two cars with that money <laughs> like it's it's really insane but it's it's an investment because it the value grows with time because like you know Especially old violins, they're a little more expensive because it's like they're from 1920 or 1870. Oh, so value so, doesn't deteriorate, it grows. No, I'm, I'm, unless you like damage the instrument. Okay. But if you like take care of it and you keep it in good shape and you play it, like playing it makes it open up and sound better, especially if you play well on it, then the value just goes up. And a lot of shops, if you buy from like a nice violin shop, they have like a trade-in policy. So if one day you want to upgrade to your from a 10000 to a seventeen thousand dollar violin you can like trade in yours and pay the difference so it's a whole thing but yeah there there a lot of people are shocked to find out just how much a good instrument costs so moving from there how often would you say that you do practice as a performance major um Ideally, it would be seven days a week, but let's be real, not realistic. <laughs> it's usually five or six days. Um, five would be kind of not very good. I usually try to, even if, you know, day six is really hectic and busy, at least like play basics on the instrument, play some scales, make sure you still have a good, uh, good handle on the instrument. But it's, I usually end up taking one day to not play just because I kind of have to catch mm-hmm. up on all the obligations. I haven't been meeting because I've been playing all week, if that makes sense. So, 
Yeah, it's. I realize that it's not about two days of a lot of practice. It's about consistent practice because mm-hmm. you practice and you kind of teach your brain more information. You go to sleep, it processes it, and then the next day you kind of let it sink in because you do it again and again. I kind of started seeing violin as like, let's say you're right-handed and you're trying to learn to write with your left. It's not like, oh, I, I wasn't born with the talent of writing with my left hand. It's more like... um you could do it. It's just something your body doesn't know how to do yeah. yet. So you, you have to like reinforce the motions every day. And eventually you can be as fluent with your left hand as your right. But mm-hmm. it's just like a painful process getting there sometimes. <laughs> as your, cause your brain knows what it wants to do. You have to teach your body certain things. So I have this question, but I mean, I'm assuming the answer is already yes, because I've heard you talk so passionately about it a okay. couple of minutes ago. It, it's, is it as fun to play the music as it is to listen to it? Yes. If anything, it's, it's, it's kind of more fulfilling because, um, cause it, you're making it. I don't know. Yeah. I just, I like the process. I like the process of, uh, figuring out like, how do I make this better? How do I make my technique better? I like, I like going to different professors and hearing different mm-hmm. different comments and just I don't know though like I I would hate sitting with textbooks all day like shout out to all you medical students I don't know how you <laughs> do it I like that my I get to spend my days kind of actively doing something and that's playing it's very involved your bo- your body's involved your brain's involved so I, that's it's really an immersive experience, and time kind of flies when you hit a nice focus state. So it is, it's just as fun to play, and it's it's kind of like a risky business, like playing in front of people sometimes. So it's it's exciting and scary. Music gets a bad rap. It does. Classical music does, and I don't know. I have hope. Like people always say, "Oh, is it dying?" It's just like you know how classical music audiences like have a lot of older people yeah. it's not that people back then like classical music i just think it takes a lot of people uh, like many years to come around to it you mm-hmm. know so I'm, I'm happy i got on the train early i have my whole life to listen to it oh oh okay so the, my final oops sorry my final question about the actual instrument oh shoot my final question about the actual instrument itself okay does that thing where you're playing the instrument and then all the bows, like, whip off of the violin ever happen to you? I've definitely dropped my bow while playing on stage, like, three times in my life at least. Like, nothing bad happened. It just kind of, like, flew out of my hand or something. No, 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 no. I mean, like, there was this one video where, like, she, like this girl was playing really fast. Oh, and, and the then, like, hair? the hairs literally, like, snapped oh, out no, of Oh, no, that's bow. a nightmare. No. <laughs> Please, no, I hope that never happens. It was amazing, and she, I don't know which video you're talking about, but I, there was one where, like, an advanced violinist was playing. There was a beginner, and she looked really scared when it happened. There was an advanced violinist that wasn't looking at her bow at all when she was playing, and she was, like, playing a big passage, and her bow broke, and she kept playing with, like, the hair just, like, kind of limp and the stick, and you just see her face, like, 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 look concerned like why what happened this is so weird and then she (laughs) sees her bow after she finishes playing i don't know that's amazing that's crazy that's never happened i hope it doesn't happen is there any way to control that or does it just happen from like too much playing i mean bows are objects they break too i mean if they break on stage that'd be unfortunate but i mean mishaps happen like the like i I follow Hillary Hahn on Instagram, which is a uh, uh, solo. So she's a soloist, and um, she had some concert with uh, I forgot which orchestra, but her, like she was like taking her mute off, which is like this uh, piece of plastic or rubber you put on the bridge of your violin, the the like wooden thing that holds the strings mm-hmm. up to like mute the sound. And she was either putting it on or off, and her whole bridge fell over oh. mid concert. But there were people that knew how to fix it backstage, so they they got it. But that's just one of those things that's like, we don't know how to fix that. Oh. We know how to adjust bridges a little bit, but, you know, life is life. Flat tire, broken bow, you can't, you can't really prevent these things. <laughs> you can just take care of your instrument and hope that's enough. Okay. Well, let's go to our last section. Our last section of questions. The future. 
what do you dream of doing? What is your what is your future? What what do you see yourself doing after you graduate? Um I know life will get hectic and busy and the need to make money will be a real thing, but ideally I'll keep practicing. Um I'll keep, you know, kind of honing my craft. I really like that process of learning and some people are like you need to like calm down and play music more not worry so much about improving all the time so but other than like making sure i still have time to do that the dream would be you know a symphony job or you know opera pit opera orchestra playing i just want the opportunity to keep playing like big orchestral works and keep playing chamber music with people and um, I'm kind of willing to forego a normal life, per se, to do that. Mm-hmm. So it's really tough to win a job. So I kind of have this, um, like an orchestra job. So I kind of have this thing going where I'm like, I'm not going to let myself get discouraged until I do 100 auditions. Okay. You know what I mean? Because, you know, it's kind of unrealistic to walk out of college and land a job unless you're graduating from like Juilliard or something. Yeah. Like I'm not there. But I, I think that if I keep working for the next decade and I really put myself into it, I, I can definitely, you know, make it somewhere. I just half the battle is not getting discouraged. These things take time and patience and a lot of rejections, unfortunately, along the way. Of course. So I don't know. I'm excited to, you know, I want to get my master's, keep studying. But after that is over, I do want to start working towards that 100 auditions and see if it takes me 25 or 85 to get anywhere so i like that and in your mind if you could is there like one symphony that you you uh, cso that you've always wanted to like if you could oh geez um well chicago symphony is like top five in the world kind of <laughs> orchestra so you know i'd actually rather admire them from afar <laughs> than uh you know kind of chase as my professor says, like, chase a carrot that I won't catch, probably. Like, just being super, super mm-hmm. realistic. But I'm not sure, because, you know, you don't, you don't like, go, like, oh, I, I want to work at this symphony and just happen to win a job. Because mm-hmm. it's, it's a win. Like, people, the way it works is, you know, you have anywhere from 50 to 100 people kind of auditioning for one or two places in a symphony. So you need, you need a whole, you need a combination of, you know, your hard work and talent and luck, everything just needs, the, the the planets have to align for you that day to win a job. So I can't really decide what city or where, but I mean, no matter what I end up doing, I just, I hope I keep playing music. I'm sure it's a little And whatever you. city and whatever country I end up living in, so. I'm, I'm sure they'll align. They'll align. They'll yeah, align. I hope so. Okay. What is... What's one piece of advice that you'd give a musician who wants to follow the same path you're following right now? Oh, even mm-hmm. though you've already given like amazing advice throughout this entire yeah. thing. I wish, I mean, I would tell five, year, five years ago me so much that it's hard to give <laughs> one piece of advice. But I would always, everyone has different circumstances and it's hard to, um, it's a little harder to make it in, in music in this country if you're not from a higher socioeconomic background. So I would tell, you know, people that are in those shoes, like, do the best you can with the resources you can. If you, like, give in your honest work and stay positive, um, things will work out, things will align, you will end up with better resources to study music in college than you do, than you have before college. And also just... There's so much advice I give. I guess, can I narrow it down to two things? Yeah, actually? yeah go for it. One, so one one thing is, if music is what you want to do, do music. There's so many other things to distract you in the world. Just focus on music. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot of other interests, but make music your priority because that's what it takes to make it. And the second is, um, see, I'm already blinking on what the second thing is. Oh, the second thing is believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. If you don't, who will? And also, so many people will that don't really know you, don't know how hard you work, don't know what you're capable of, will be quick to tell you to do something else. And all I'm saying is there 
you know, there is, there are a bunch of symphony players who says that can't be you. And the only way you'll find out is if you really try it for yourself. I don't know if that's super well articulated. It is. But, I mean, I've heard a lot of things that might have turned me away from music, but I decided to keep going with it. And, you know, every day I feel like I'm closer to what I want to do. And I'm don't let anybody strip that opportunity away from you. If that if it's really what you want to do, but it's it's work. It's not it's not like oh I love music. Mm-hmm. Let me go into it. It's it's work. <laughs> it's definitely work. So I I hope that kind of gives you all a better look into the highs and lows of. Uh, I need another pause to playing reflect. Violin. Moment. <laughs> playing violin for a living. Um. Ah. <laughs> uh. That was really good. Was it? You're really good, yeah. Was it? I thought I wasn't really funny, and I thought I talked too much, and I... Oh, we're not over yet. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're going to edit this out. You're going to edit this Absolutely out. Absolutely not, no. Oh, my God. This is staying in. I'm going to cry. Uh, this is my first podcast, guy. Uh, okay. Um, we'll just... We're just going to pretend that never happened. We're not editing it out. We're just going <laughs> to pretend that never happened. And we're going to go to the oh next question. Oh, my God. Claudio question. Uncensored. Um, Believe in yourself, but then when you think no one's listening, like, <laughs> bash on your podcast skills. <laughs> I was saying how good the quote was your things were, but also the whole podcast was good, Thank too. You, John. But the podcast's not done yet. Um, it's almost done. Don't worry, listeners. There's probably only, hopefully, like five minutes left, seven minutes left. So, finally, what's your favorite or most inspired? This is a really hard question. Everyone likes to give me a different answer. Um, well, of course they do because everyone's a different person. Sorry, sorry, listeners. Um, what's your favorite or most inspiring piece of media of all time? Like movie, a uh, piece of music, um, game Ooh, of all time wow. you can give me multiple if that helps that is very very hard and it, it also changes like year to year something there what is yours john just oh uh oh the, the tables have been turned on to me yeah um i also need <laughs> some time to think uh oh no because i do have one um okay this isn't my one of all time but because i do know i have one of all time um and this isn't it but um one that i uh has inspired me recently um is the play the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime okay they're the they're playing it at our uh craner our yeah, university theater, theater illinois program um, is putting it on and uh, it's very good, and I don't want to describe too much about it without spoiling it, but if you get a chance to see it, check it out. Um, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful play. Oh, my God, I'm still stuck. Because now I'm like, do I see a piece of music? Do I see a movie? And I don't watch many movies, so that's pretty crazy. Um, I don't know. I, I can't say of all time. But just in general, thus spoke Zarathustra, like the, or also, also spoke Zarathustra, or Zarathustra, by Richard Strauss, is a tone poem based on Friedrich Nietzsche's novel. And the beginning of the piece is the 2001 Space Odyssey theme, you know. Is that the dun dun dun? Yes, the dun 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 dun. Yeah, whatever. I sing that wrong because I can't get... I don't have that range of voice, but... (laughs) Yeah, like that, John, exactly. So everyone knows the beginning of that piece, but I I recommend you guys just sit down and listen to also Sprock Zarathustra. It's it's an incredible piece that I got to play recently, and I don't know. It's... There's something about it that just tells you about life, so... I don't know. That's not maybe not the of all time my favorite no, thing I'm ever. No, I'm disappointed in my answer too because mine's not all time either. It's so hard. I feel like we're just all inspired by the little bits and pieces we of everything everywhere. You know what I mean? That's kinda, really good. Is that, is that good? That's good. I mean, 
there's some kind of vulnerability I see in Bjork, if you know who Bjork is. Um, is she the one with the swan? Yeah, the swan dress. That album is just incredible. And then there's some kind of, you know, feeling you get when you listen to uh, Brahms. And there's, you know, you just, everyone kind of just, you, you pick a divine thing from everything. From film, from media. I don't know. I think it's little... Little bits of every piece of art that kind of ends up being the inspiration. Mm-hmm. I yeah. don't know. Is that a good That's answer? That's a good answer. I don't know. It helped save us from not being able to find us. Honestly. Like, <laughs> I don't know how much of this, but we definitely spent a few minutes here um, yeah. thinking about no, it, whether okay. you heard our thoughts or not. Um, well, uh, that's all That's all I have, honestly. Um, do you have anything else that you'd like to discuss? <laughs> I don't know what that <laughs> I don't know like as soon as you said what should we discuss I'm just like how I don't want to s- do a singing quiz this Friday <laughs> Ming we love Ming, you Ming we love you well thank you all for listening and we'll catch you next time on Gerard the Dinosaur bye everyone bye